Today we are here in Dayton, Ohio, visiting Innovative Sterilization Technologies, exclusive manufacturer and provider of the One Tray System and Easy Track Surgical Set Customization Trays. My name is Justin Poulin, and I want to welcome you to this episode of Beyond the Tour. Dayton's entrepreneurial climate nurtured innovators such as Charles Kettering, inventor of the automobile self-starter, as well as air travel pioneers, the Wright brothers. And today we're here visiting one of the modern day innovators in this great city. Our tour begins in the very neighborhood where innovative sterilization technologies began. We sat down with this group of longtime friends who saw disruptive potential in a new technology. We literally sat here and had a conversation about, okay, I got this idea. There's a product that I think we can create. I need some help to do it. And I got some earmarked positions and some things we need to look at prior to. And that's when kind of Chuck came in. There's a lot of close relationships in our company. Chuck was my high school football coach. That's how I know him. The rest of us all lived in this neighborhood. So funny that we all ended up running the company together and trying to build in one tray. Chuck, I think it's fascinating that you were Scott's coach. And I'm curious, Bob, you grew up in this area. Did you know I these did. guys? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, it was amazing yesterday to come into the company and realize that Chuck and I literally were two years apart in the same high school. And I, I thinking about, I kept looking at him thinking, I know that guy. And then it was like the wrestling room. That's it. <laughs> that, that was his <laughs> giant <laughs> walked in, you know, and I'm like, oh, you know, as a sophomore. And so for me, that was really cool. And then learning today that, you know, Scott went to Oak Hills as well. And Chuck, your son is the head of the education department, which is such a cool thing. It seems like there's a similar family dynamic happening between you and these guys around the table as well. We argue every day. We're like brothers, not like, yeah, I mean, true. seriously. Alex, you're right. We, we are like brothers, we argue about everything, but at the end of the day, we all come up with the best solution for our situation, and we all buy into it, just like a team. Something I love to do in this industry is get to know the people. And we had the opportunity to sit down with them, get to know them, and then the next morning actually go to their office and get to know a little bit more about the business side. There's really no reason for us to leave Ohio. We're originally from all the same area, but also if you think of Dayton and the history with the Wright brothers and innovation, it made sense. And as we were kicking around names, innovative sterilization technology, it just made sense. I would imagine over the last five years, there's been some pressure to move some production overseas. We've seen a lot of companies do that in the industry. What was the decision at IST to keep it in the United States? The decision started when we created the company because the decision was, do we go overseas initially and, and try to save money from day one, or do we keep it here in the US and keep our eye on the quality? Um, that was a pretty easy decision, I think, at, at that point when we, when we started the company. Uh, it's become a really big decision because of what we're doing from a quality standards position with the lifetime warranty and, and, and taking care of any issues out in the field with them. How can we manufacture this product because of the tolerances that we need to keep in this product because it's a sealed container? How can we manufacture that, one, quickly and get it to market, but Two, from a quality standpoint, keep the quality at a level that we need to keep it at for the product to function. Um, we found that in a partner called Ram Manufacturing, who's local here as well. So we worked with Ram initially and it, it worked out well. We knew the owner of the company and the partnership between us allowed us to daily look at, you know, where are we at? What are we working on? You know, how can we improve this, make this process better uh, from the production side? 
Um, so that was really probably the biggest reason why Dayton in itself and, and Ohio has, uh, has remained the, the headquarters. One of my favorite opportunities on this tour was to see where these devices are assembled. And the fact that it's so close to the IST headquarters, that has to have some level of impact on the trust between these two partners. Hank, you bring up like a really great point. As we know, even at Beyond Clean, just getting off the ground with a new business, like it is so important that you establish this level of trust with the partners that are gonna help you build your business. It's really amazing that they were able to deliver this level of innovation in such a short period of time. Yeah and they were able to do it all right there in Dayton. We brought a product to market that everybody said you couldn't do. We changed a paradigm in a marketplace that people said you couldn't do. They've actually yelled it to us at <laughs> you know, the yeah, 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 one of Scott's very first conference ever, he's got somebody in his face yelling at him, you know. But that's what we did. We decided to bring a great solution to the marketplace, understanding all these obstacles we were gonna face. You can't do that, you're wrong. But you know what? It goes back to what we always say. It's the facts. It's the science. Start off with the facts, prove the science. We're a science-based industry. Prove the science and let them make their decisions. Joining us the next morning in the conference room at IST was Dave Jagrosi, a former sterile processing department manager who has journeyed from skeptic to supporter of OneTray technology. The one tray brought two major efficiencies to the table. Anything outside of this container with moisture in it has to be rejected. And not only is it rejected, but if that's in the OR on the sterile field, the whole field is contaminated. The one tray eliminates that. And we're also in a rigid container, so it also eliminates the possibility of having holes or tears from the blue sterilization wrap. With a shared history of running sterile processing departments, Bob and Dave were able to find some time to chat about the real world impact Dave experienced when his department adopted OneTray technology. So what was your initial reaction to the technology? Getting over that learning curve, that what do you mean no dry time? Because no dry time by nature means there's gonna be moisture left over in the container. And in our normal world, moisture means there could be contamination. But once you read the studies and learn about the filtration system, you knew that it was safe and effective. It's really cool with the, anytime you hear and see new innovation in healthcare, which is something that we desperately need, it makes a huge impact on a department or a facility and it, it's done the same for you, I assume. Yeah, definitely. As you know, the autoclave only has so much capacity and we only have so much time in a day. So let's just say my, my number one autoclave, we were able to run 10 cycles in that in a day. Well, reducing that 45 minute dry time, we were able to put 15 cycles in that same machine in the same time period in a day. And you might imagine that means it didn't spill over to the third shift and then onto the day shift. A lot of efficiencies in labor and uh, savings in time. Absolutely. Having grown up in the operating room as a clinician, uh, I, I think I was one of those people that struggle with the moisture in, in the container. Um, have there been any adverse events from any of your trays having moisture in them? We've had zero adverse events reported for this product over the inception and, and up till today. Um, so there's never been an adverse event reported. Um, we have over 25,000 containers in the marketplace. We've done over 5 million runs in the marketplace. Um, this product is proven. That's beyond a shadow of a doubt. The science backs it up, the usage backs it up. It's a safe, effective product to utilize for speedy and efficient uh, turnover of instrumentation. Just a few miles from the office, Mike Faulkner, president of sales, introduced us to Dr. Jamal Taha, a renowned spinal surgeon who detailed some of his experiences as an early adopter of OneTray technology. Dr. Taha has really been involved, you know, since the beginning as far as he really understood the technology and he understood the, the impact that it could have on, on his business and, and obviously the patient safety and he was both feet right from the very beginning. And how have you noticed that this innovative technology has shifted your ability to care for the patients that you see? Well, it all started uh, when I had two cases canceled. Okay. <laughs> one, one because the wrapping had holes in it, and the other because they didn't have enough instruments. Okay. And uh, that time when uh, I was introduced to the technology, I said, that's it, that, that would solve the problem. And have you asked? actually been able to reduce the number of instrument trays that you have on the sterile field? Oh, absolutely. I'm still alive. I was going to have like a heart attack. <laughs> so absolutely, yeah, it, it has caused a, a significant decline. 
uh, in that uh, problem. I love the fact that these guys saw the industry challenge that was out there and realized that they had a potentially game-changing solution for it. Yeah, and they had done all this work to take this innovative product and bring it to market. But then they quickly realized what it takes to actually start to implement this disruptive technology and get people on board with it. Once they started gaining momentum, I think the whole industry started realizing just how disruptive this technology really was. I think we were under the radar still at that point too. So, say, yeah, so yeah. your your audience doesn't have any preconceived notions exactly. about the product, including your competitors. And, yeah, and and today those preconceived notions are fought hard to implement to our end user by competitors out there, and they've honestly done a good job of it. Um, the disinformation that they've thrown out there makes it much harder to have just a direct scientific conversation about this better mousetrap. I agree. I, I don't think at that point we were well known enough to create any real market scare. So I went in there and quite frankly, everybody came in with open arms and was thrilled to see me come back. And I think that did evolve for, I think we got away with it for about a year and a half to two years. Mm -hmm. And then everybody kind of realized that one tray existed. They all looked at it as a competitor, even though that's not our niche. You had these people saying, we're threatening their business, so therefore, we gotta step up and do something. Bring it in to the patient, you know, and if we're looking at this conversation outside, just the public, you know, watching the story unfold, and the question becomes, yeah, the science of sterilization is the same, but the impact on the speed or the availability on, of the trays themselves have come up. And what many patients don't know, if you're the second case of the day, the third case of the day, there is a real question and challenge out there. Are your trays going to be as available and sterile and ready to go as the first patient of the day on that surgery schedule? And that is one of the premium challenges out there that patients are just unaware. Yep. The speed at which you can meet that patient need, that second case, that third case, that fourth case. But that really brings up that other point that we haven't delved into a lot of, that dry time has nothing to do with sterilization. So why we're able to do it quicker is obviously because we're eliminating that dry time. But in everybody said when we go out into the, you know, to educate people, they automatically connect those two things, that, that sterilization and dry time are, are together, when really they're two separate things obviously one to achieve 10 to the negative six and the second being to get that material back to a state where you know where it's now a particular barrier again so you know that's again where the education comes in I think that's one of the most enlightening things for me having been in this industry for over 30 years I grew up in the operating room moved to sterile processing and I can be one of those people who are well we need to do it this way because it's what the standards saying we do it this way but I think one of my biggest takeaways of being here with you is not one time since I've been here have I heard you say we want to sell 100 million units, we want to make X dollars. It's all been about we want to provide a solution to a huge problem. And at the end of the day, the solution is patient safety mm -hmm. because that different standard of care that Hank was talking about is a big deal. Uh, I'm a re recipient of a total joint, you are. And that's something, if you're in industry, that's on your mind when you're going into surgery, if you're not the first case of the day. Every minute that, that a surgeon is frustrated, they're focused on something other than then the person who's yeah, under the drape. Right. And that's the person who deserves 100% of their attention. So having a solution that can help the surgeon focus on that person under the drape, is, it's, it's really a big deal. And it's, for me, it's been really cool to hear that and, and hear you all tell your story about the company. You know. Why we're excited about Beyond Clean being here, right? You guys are about educating the industry. Well, we saw that firsthand. We realized day one that we're bringing a disruptive technology to the marketplace. And we're gonna tell people, Dave Jagrosi, moisture is okay in our container. And he's gonna look at you like you're nuts. And then we have to prove it. As Scott mentioned, the scientific evidence, we had so much of it to support the, the information we were sharing with the public and in the industry, but we had to do that paradigm shift. Right? We had to get the Dave Jagrosis and other sterile processing managers to listen to our facts, take the scientific evidence, and then move it into their environment. Because it's a win-win. Scott, last night we talked about how you really serve 
efficiency on both sides of the table, not just hospitals, but also vendors. And your latest product, the EasyTrack system, is really a great example of that. You're right, we, we kind of fall into both categories, and that's by design. Um, what we try to do is, you know, work with the hospitals, work with the facilities to minimize some of the vendor trays, but also work with the vendors to minimize the trays. You know, initially vendor trays for knees and hips were one or two or three sets of instrumentation 20 years ago. Now they're seven or eight or nine sometimes. So many unused instruments. So to your point, that winds up being a lot of added work that's unnecessary. What kind of reduction are we talking? So again, these are universal systems. So meaning they work with all of the vendors and we've worked with all of the vendors to put their instrumentation in our configurations. Um, but what we're looking at is anywhere from six to eight trays we get down to three trays every time. So you're talking a reduction of a minimum of 50%. Minimum. minimum. And so what's that gonna look like for you know a hospital that's trying to save money too? Because 50%, eight trays down to three, like I'm thinking there's shipping costs associated with that. There's all these other costs that not everybody thinks about. I know the sterile processing departments are gonna think, that's a lot less instruments for me, but there's gotta be something that the people who are managing the budget are looking at and saying, wow, that's gonna have a big impact on, you know, from a more soft cost kind of standpoint. Well, immediately you're gonna see a reduction in the processing costs at the facility level. So if you go from seven or eight trays down to three, there's a cost per tray that the hospital or the facility is gonna incur. We hear that 50 to $75, uh, we've heard higher than that, but if it's $75, you know, multiply that by four of the reduction of the trays, you know, there's $300 on the bottom line of cost savings for a facility for each case. That's just for one wow. case. For the OEM facility, they're having to ship that instrumentation a lot of times in. So if they're shipping that, and they're shipping almost everything overnight, so there's a high cost to each one of those trays that's out there. Um, those shipping costs are 40 to $45 per tray each way. So if we look at going from seven trays down to three, you know, 65% reduction in shipping costs. I know that one of the major OEMs spent last year almost $300 million on shipping. Just one? Just one, just one. And how many procedures did you tell us this morning are being done every year? Uh, over a million. Wow. So if you look at, you know, if you look at an OEM saving, you know, four trays on the front side, uh, of shipping and then four trays on the back side of coming back, you know, you're looking at a four to $500 cost savings, multiply that by- By a million, that's $500 million in cost half savings. Half a billion dollars. At least opportunity. Just for the OEM. Now there's also the cost savings on the processing side for the hospital and the facilities. If you're a patient or you're somebody that pays health insurance premiums, when you start talking numbers that size, you have to be taking some level of interest to say, if we can take half a billion dollars out of the healthcare system by improving efficiencies, reducing tray size, that that's gonna be something that any consumer would wanna know about. As you know, somebody's gonna pay for it. Whether it's the hospital, the patient, the OEM, you know, the, the vendor, whoever's gonna pay for it. If we can remove that cost, everybody should do that. We traveled to Rhode Island where Dr. Robert Marchand, one of the most experienced Mako robotic surgeons in the world and another early adopter of one tray technology, shared the efficiencies his practice has experienced utilizing one tray technology. You're kind of a case study here, and I think what I wanted to ask you specifically was how this product has impacted your capacity in terms of your surgical caseload volumes. The one tray is highly efficient in sterilization. The Easy Tracks takes all that equipment that we normally have to process in the one trays and condense it down. So we have the one tray efficiencies, and we have Easy Tracks with less equipment. So we can do nine, ten cases and be out of here by 4:35. Or so it's phenomenal. From the OR standpoint, the hospital standpoint, we run two rooms four days a week. So we went from 10 to 15 cases, total joints, to about 30 a week, personally. And so you're out of here earlier. When we get more cases in, the hospital's happier. Uh, we're out of here earlier. We have less time between cases because the sterilization is quick, but the opening and setup is also very quick. So it helps on both ends. Back in Dayton, the innovative sterilization technology team shared with us the uphill battle that comes with introducing a disruptive technology to the healthcare industry. The biggest problem I found is that no matter how great it was, no matter how much science, people were just like, we've never had a change. You know, that's, and, and, that's and not I, how we do it. And that's <laughs> not, that's, <laughs> that's yeah, not we've always done it this key way. Key phrase, not how we do it. Right. And, and I found that to be probably the biggest obstacle I had, getting them to understand that 
Right, but if you were using your old flip phone and you went to an iPhone, and you had to bring it down to that level to let everybody know that that's how big a change this is. The people that understood the technology and took the time to listen and educate themselves, they accepted this technology because it isn't that difficult to understand. Sterilization is sterilization, right? We're achieving a sterility level, we're killing the microbials, and we're pushing instrumentation up to the OR. So what makes this so different? We always use our saying was, you know, you can hold me to a higher standard, don't hold me to a different standard. When faced with the task of educating an industry about a new technology, Barbara Ann Harmer is a voice backed by a staggering resume ranging from over 43 years as a perioperative nurse leader to nearly 25 years as a CMS surveyor. I don't think that anyone at the company truly understood the need, the necessity for teaching and educating the entire country. Um, what we have found is that there has been a lot of deficits in understanding what really happens during the process of sterilization. And this particular product turned lots of people back on their heels because it untaught them things that they thought that they knew that in fact they never really did know to begin with. And one of the things too is the opportunity to educate through marketing. And Chris, if you don't mind touching on just the, the challenge that comes with marketing a disruptive product. Um, so I'm sure there's a list of Yeah, we threw her in that fire. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but also um, the sort of the interplay between education and your marketing efforts of such a disruptive product in the marketplace. Sure. So I think one of the hardest things to do in marketing is change the perception. And it's been sort of a difficult road because early on starting a new company, you have limited resources and we kind of took the path of least resistance to try to just tell people what it does instead of helping them understand truly what it does. So we kind of had a gap early on and we're learning now that that understanding isn't there. And so that's part of why we really want to take a position of educating. Even in social media, I want to answer everybody that's talking. And when, when it's in a private group, you know, people will ask questions and you see people answering it, and then you look at the followers in that group, and it's like 6,000 people just saw that misconception and that claim that is completely untrue, and it's just not realistic for us to be able to go in and reply to everybody. You know, there are a lot of things that we can agree on as an industry, and I saw those themes come out in my conversation with Barbara and the emphasis on education that this company has put in place. It's funny to hear clinicians you know, talk about, oh, well, how can water inside the tray be sterile while they have a bottle of sterile water right beside them on the table? So obviously, there is such a thing as sterile water, but what's the difference in water in that bottle and in water in the bottom of a tray? That's the hard fact, especially people that are in my generation, to grasp because we were always told that water was bad. Well, it's not that the water is bad, it's how did the water get there? And so the water that is contained in a one tray, first of all, doesn't stay there forever, but the water that gets in there is coming in from, through the form of steam molecules. And what happens is hydrogen and oxygen bonds break down and create that moisture. That moisture, unfortunately, most people don't get the concept. It doesn't stay in the tray forever. People think that instruments are just sitting in water for extended period of time. Actually, in performance testing that we did, we were able to prove that all of the water has turned back into a vapor, escaped again through the filtering process in five days or less. In 2010, a multidisciplinary group got together to define the difference between flash sterilization and immediate use steam sterilization industry terminology. Barbara Ann was part of this group. Can you explain a little bit about the confusion around that paper, the original intent, and then how it's being used today? Absolutely. It is very interesting to see how it's been translated in the, in the general public sphere. But having sat at that table, the priority and the design of that group getting together was to stop the inadequacies of flash. Now, it didn't really come from sterilization. It came from the fact that we needed to halt the process of taking a dirty instrument from the operating room floor uh, per se, taking it to a substerile room, washing it with, with, with whatever soap was at the sink, 
okay? Could be hand soap, could be ivory liquid, it didn't really much matter. Washing it off with our bare hands, no toothbrush, no instruments, no sponges, and throwing it in an open tray in a sterilizer, in the substerile. And that's really how flash was accomplished back in my early days in the 70s. Yeah. However, we go full force into the future, since we're back in 2005, 2006, we didn't start meeting at a table until 2010, okay, with the paper being published in 2011. So the, the terminology is completely different. The similarity between the terms immediate use from the one tray FDA clearance document and immediate use steam sterilization, or IUSS, has led many people to believe they mean the same thing, something IST has worked hard to correct within the industry. So we've always had shelf life since the 510K was cleared. And so for that reason, you can store our tray. Solutions to problems like that is where true innovation really does exist. And it seems like you guys have really found the silver bullet uh, to solving these age old problems that people have tried to put a band-aid over for decades. Now we just gotta continue to educate. We just gotta continue to help people understand the science, the facts, and teach them the proper way to process these trays. And work the, with them to implement. So with all the work that you've put in so far, where do you go from here? You know, what we started out doing was to create a technology that impacts healthcare, not one part of healthcare, but healthcare in general, to offer better healthcare to the patient, whether that be through the surgeon doing more cases, whether it be with the hospital, saving money and becoming more efficient doing it. That's the end game. And I think that's what we're gonna achieve.